Welcome everyone to Data and the Greater Good. And this is our fourth virtual meetup. And I want to extend my thanks to those of you that are returning or if you're joining us for the first time uh, for continuing to have community with us or starting to have community with us virtually as we uh, are in these COVID times. Uh, but we've been able to successfully pivot into this framework and uh, have had a lot of success so far. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Data in the Greater Good is a community uh, where our focus is the use of data in mission-driven organizations. So nonprofits come and talk to us about how data advances uh, their vision, what they can offer their audiences, enables them to be more effective. Um, and we've really had the privilege of having a number of, of outstanding organizations, the Met, Donors Choose, uh, the Whitney Museum, New York Cares, New York Public Library, and several others come in and talk to us how the beauty of data uh, has advanced their success. And we're honored to have with us tonight New York Classical Theater, our first performing arts organization. I'm Elaine Gamble, and I am the community leader for data and the greater good. And again, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you. New York Classical in its 20 year history has offered free classical performances in New York public spaces uh, from Central Park, as well as others all around the city. Its professional level performances are free to all attendees, New Yorkers of all neighborhoods, of all walks of life, regardless of income can come and enjoy a professional performance free of charge, which captures the essence of community. Um, in New York City. And we are honored to have with us uh, the managing director of New York Classical Theater, Hillary Cohen, who will talk to us uh, about the role of data at New York Classical, as well as Megan Callahan, uh, who works with Hillary at Donnelly. To tell you a little bit more about uh, Hillary, Hillary has had a very distinguished career in nonprofit management. Uh, with a range of organizations and a track record of success that includes the Manhattan Theater Company, the Film Forum, the Wave Hill Public Garden and Cultural Center, at the New York, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, and of course, New York Classical Theater. She is a graduate of Drexel University and went on to continue her education at New York University. She has also served as a grant panelist for the Alliance of Resident Theaters in New York City and a proud member of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Joining Hillary from Donerly is Megan Callahan, a development consultant at Donerly, which works with nonprofits on fundraising and research areas. Megan has expertise in areas that include fundraising, grant proposals, and event planning, among other areas, and also partnering to develop new strategies around campaigns. She has a BFA from Florida State University. Hillary and Megan will talk to us about um, their data journey at New York Classical and the, the role of data that has taken and will continue to take New York Classical to the next level of success. Before we go into their talk, uh, if you have questions that come to mind as they're speaking, uh, you can type those into the chat box. You don't have to type your whole question or just uh, that you have a question or you can type in the question. And once their talk is complete, I will call on you and you can share your question with the audience. I know there are a lot of us on the line, uh, but in our experience, we'd like to hear your voice when you're sharing your question. So uh, we hope that will work for everyone. Now we will go into the heart of our talk Welcome, Hillary. It's so wonderful to have you at Data in the Greater Good. And welcome, Megan. And I will turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, it's really marvelous to be here. Um, we appreciate you inviting us and, and for that warm welcome. Um, New York Classical Theater was founded in 2000 uh, by artistic director Stephen Birdman. I like to say we produce historic plays with contemporary artists growing future audiences. 
All of our plays are interpretations of scripts from before 1900 by writers like William Shakespeare, Oscar Wilde, and Charles Dickens. We perform in large public spaces for free, open to the public. Theater is a major business sector in New York, the United States, and the world. Um, we're only a very small but unique part of the larger industry. Uh, to put us into context, we don't charge people for our performances, so this means we serve more local audience members, about 87% compared to Broadway's 35%, and we serve more people who can't afford Broadway prices. Some of our audience members make one-fifth of the typical Broadway household's income. We depend on the financially secure people in our audience to donate to support our programs. So we're there for them as well as their neighbors who can only afford New York Classical. Uh, when she approached us about presenting, Elaine asked me, what does good data look like? Um, and what is considered uh, industry standard for a nonprofit theater company? We don't have shareholders, but uh, we do have audiences, patrons, and, and sponsors. So good data gives us the information we need to cultivate relationships with those people. It's how we adjust, adjust our investments, like where we should spend our marketing dollars. Um, and it can also give us um, quantitative and qualitative feedback, just like a JD Power satisfaction score ranking, would you recommend our product or service? Our good data is not remarkably different from anyone with customers. It, it just means that our customers are our audiences, patrons, and sponsors. The gold standard for anyone with customers over the past, I would say five to 10 years, has been called a 360 degree view. Um, it basically means we know who our audience is and we know when they're interacting with us. When I was hired um, uh, in 2018, we, uh, but it wasn't necessarily organized in a way that we could use it. Um, we weren't necessarily capturing the information we needed and we didn't have the tools that work together. Um, so we couldn't really uh, make the most out of that data to parse it in terms of analysis. Um, we had a MailChimp account, but our messages were consistently going unopened uh, by 83% of the recipients. We have a patrons program where individuals make an annual donation and we thank them with a year of donor perks and events. Uh, but there were months in our 2017-2018 season with no patrons program membership income at all. So I estimate because our email messages were only opened by about 17% of our audience and our donor data wasn't interacting with our email program, our individual giving revenue could have been as much as 6% higher every month. My plan to uh, address this uh, gap was to get us into an online uh, box office software tool um, to partner with a vendor who could help us analyze and prioritize new data and to develop a data-oriented communications calendar that was informed by real audience behavior and demographics. Uh, in the fall of 2018, we went CRM shopping and we transitioned into a box office software called Audience View Professional. It allowed us to collect information about thousands of new audience members. It was then we hired Donorly to help us prioritize and um, analyze the new information we collected. Hi everyone, I'm Megan. Um, I'm a development consultant at Donorly. Um, thank you, Elaine, for that intro and Hillary for this um, setup. Uh, so just quickly, Donorly is a fundraising consulting firm. Um, we specialize in working with small and mid-sized organizations across the nonprofit sector. Uh, but we do work with a lot of performing arts organizations in New York, um, just like New York Classical. So in all of our work, we prioritize community building, 
storytelling and solid data. Um, and beyond our donor and prospect research uh, services, we also offer capital campaign consulting, grant writing, um, development staffing, and gala and event support. So we started to work with uh, New York Classical in, I believe it was October of 2019. And as Hillary mentioned, they had all of this really great data that they were collecting um, so that they were learning so much about who their audience members were and you know, how often they were coming to shows and what shows they um, kept coming back to. So this was all really great, obviously, for Hillary and New York Classical to, to know and to use when building up these relationships. So Don't Really comes into play to uh, help add a layer of fundraising related context to all of that information and to help identify who could potentially be a good donor for New York Classical. So we uncover um, who has a history of donating to nonprofits, what types of causes they might support, and um, their financial capacity to support those organizations. So when a client has a, a really large list of data like New York Classical did, um, with not a lot of context behind it, uh, we typically would use a wealth screening and then manual rankings in order to quickly identify some top prospects. So basically the goal is to take that really large list and winnow it down into a manageable number of prospects um, that Hillary could then approach for a, don a donation or further involvement with the organization. Um, so basically, we're trying to find the needles uh, in the haystack and figure out who Hillary should be prioritizing for fundraising purposes. So on the next slide, um, this is showing uh, two examples of deliverables. So the first one um, is the well screening. And this is an automated process um, that ranks prospects by their potential gift capacity. So we use a tool called iWave for these screenings. Um, for New York Classical, we did screen about 1,500 people. Um, and I will say that the text on the screen is probably a little hard to read. It's a little small. Um, but that just goes to show um, a well screening returns an Excel sheet with a lot of columns, a lot of information. Um, and all of that uh, uses a prospect's propensity, affinity, and capacity. Um, and those three things are sort of rated and estimated and combined, um, and it gives us back all this data. Um, so those are three terms that we typically use uh, to summarize a patron's ability uh, and the likelihood that they might make a gift to a certain cause. So iWave does this uh, using publicly available data, which would include uh, property ownership, a uh, history of charitable giving uh, and political contributions among some other factors. Um, and what this will give us uh, is a pro score uh, that weighs all three of those aspects, uh, affinity, propensity, and capacity, and it rates uh, someone on a score from one to four. So when we get those results back, we usually will go to the client and talk about the best way to winnow down that list. Um, we typically would say, you know, let's look at people with a pro score of three or four. Those are the two highest scores, um, which would mean that these people have an inclination or an affinity to give to an organization like New York Classical um, and that they have the financial capacity to do that. So in general, a well screening will help us um, separate about half of the list of prospects from the original list. Um, for New York Classical, I think we ended up with almost 500 um, prospects that had a score of three or four, um, which was about 30% of their original list. So that's a great way to sort of look into a, a smaller group of people. Um, and that's where we would start uh, focusing our attention. So the second example, on this um, slide here is uh, what we call manual rankings, which is what we would uh, do as a next step after a wealth screen. 
our research team will manually verify all of the top prospects from the well screen. Um, and we use a, an A, B, C um, scale. And again, this is based on an individual's capacity and inclination. Um, but we, we do this extra step to basically confirm that the information that came back from the screening is accurate. Um, and it helps us to eliminate some errors that can happen. Um, most commonly that is if someone has a common name, the well screen can sometimes um, give results for the wrong person. So this way we can check and make sure that we're looking at the right person and the information is accurate. And as you'll see here on this slide, we also add a reasoning column and that helps um, pull out a sample of a prospect's, basically the indicators that they might have interest in a cause like New York Classical. Um, so it basically just pulls out a sampling and gives a little deeper dive on the person's um, relevant career history or any board memberships uh, with a peer organization, um, as well as some examples of their charitable giving. So after we've done the well screening to winnow that, that original list by at least half, and then we would do some manual rankings to verify and add some more context to those results, uh, we could then move on a step further to do some even deeper research on these people. Um, particularly, we'd start by looking at those A ranked prospects. Um, so that way we can add even more context, even more details, um, so an example of something we could do would be a, we call it a thumbnail profile, which uh, basically gives much more detail around someone's job history, um, any board memberships they have, or involvement with um, any rela a related cause. Uh, we give a five-year giving capacity, show their property records, and again, we would give a more full list of their charitable giving. Um, and again, just to point out that we do this research based on uh, publicly available data that we can access through a number of different research tools. So that sort of just skims the surface on all the many types of research we can do. So from the work that we accomplished during our initial contract, uh, we did uncover over a dozen A-ranked prospects. Uh, and I will say that there probably are even more um, in that group. Uh, so our next immediate step, I would say, is probably to finish ranking that uh, list of 500 folks that came back uh, high on the well screen. And basically what happens then is we pass all of this information back to Hillary um, so that she can come up with a plan for cultivating and forming stronger relationships with um, each of these prospects. So some of those outcomes might be that um, they join the board or they become a major donor, uh, they become a gala attendee, you know, there's a number of other outcomes too. Um, so this slide shows three examples of uh, some of those A-ranked prospects that we uncovered. Um, and there's just uh, bullet points here to show that uh, they come from diverse backgrounds, careers, um, clearly, they have, you know, varied interests, and that's another really great piece of data for Hillary and New York Classical to have on hand. Uh, New York Classical really is one of my favorite clients because there's been such a clear trajectory from, you know, starting with data that they didn't know what to do with, and um, we've really made a clear pathway to some actionable steps and add some more context to all of the great data that they're collecting. So Hillary, I'll pass it back to you if you have anything else to add. Oh, well, no, thank you. Um, it's, it's, it has been a really fruitful relationship and, and we're really uh, grateful for the work that we did together. Um, you know, to Megan's point, it's like when you uh, start a partnership with a, a consultancy, there isn't usually such like clear path to like what to do next and, and just having that clarity was, was terrific. Um, so we pulled out, uh, three examples from that wealth screening and the, uh, 
breadth of the different um, people who attend our shows really kind of shine through when we started trying to find that, that hidden gem audience member who we want to deepen our relationship with. Um, so looking ahead, um, we're very excited about how much more we can do with the information that we now have. Uh, it really improves our ability to treat our audience members as valued individual parts of our community and strengthen our relationships with them. Um, and as Megan said, our, our next step would be uh, continuing to conduct additional research um, and digging into those files in, in a way that um, kind of makes sure that folks who can afford to support not only their attending the show, but also people who can, cannot afford a Broadway ticket. Um, basically, we have audience members who are buying a seat for themselves and buying the seat next to them. Um, we will continue to segment our, our MailChimp message groups. Uh, we see that our open rate is improving. Um, part of that is within our control, um, like timing and targeted content, but um, some of that uh, is definitely because New York State has been on pause. Um, we also saw a nice lift in our patrons program. Uh, the majority of our, our membership donors are renewing at their regular time of year, and we're now focusing on um, evening out those lulls and, and um, improving kind of the consistency of cash flow. So uh, those were our donor challenges in terms of being a, a data-oriented culture uh, in our fundraising efforts, um, and, and those are our remaining challenges or our, our, our next hopes for the future. So that, that's our data story at New York Classical, and I'd be happy to take any questions, and I know that uh, Megan's able to stay um, through the end to take any questions that you have about uh, her prospect research work with us or the other services that uh, Donorly offers. Thank you, Hillary and Megan, for that uh, very informative talk. Uh, before we move into q and A, I I also want to send a huge, huge thank you to my colleague, Bill Prickett from Prickett Media who is coordinating the recording of this event. So um, it will be available afterwards for you to enjoy again. Again, thank you uh, so much, Bill, uh, for all that you do to make this experience possible. So on that note, I'd like to see, does anyone have any questions? You let us know via chat or other. I actually have a question. Uh, I'll be the first one. So when you do the screening um, at Donnelly for New York Classical Theater, you're doing the, the wealth screening, the history of giving, et cetera. But what within that screening makes them uniquely um, high potential for New York Classical? Because that sounds like areas a number of organizations will be looking at, a number of organizations we'd be competing with for their contributions but what is uniquely ours such that they are a high prospect for us specifically, or is it not that kind of model? So a wealth screening is sort of the first step. And then the next steps, we would really try to focus our attention to understanding how good of a fit these people are for New York Classical. Um, the wealth screen is, uh, it's automated, but we do, we would, um, that's where the, the manual rankings come into play um, more in a more helpful way. Um, we'd have a conversation with Hillary or any other client to talk about who you view as your true peer organizations. Um, and that way, when we're doing manual rankings, we can look to see who, if those people are supporting those peer organizations specifically. Um, rather than just, you know, the theater field at large, um, because, you know, New York Classical has a different mission than, uh, you know, other nonprofit theaters. So it's important for us to understand for each and every client um, who they really truly see as their peers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Michael, we have a question from you. Do you want to share what your question is about propensity? You want me to share? Okay. So um, 
how does propensity, affinity, and capacity help prioritize the client list? So those are three terms that we use sort of just in the research field. Um, capacity looks at a person's um, financial capacity to make a gift. So um, we look at you know their, their property value, uh, their job history, which would sometimes point us to a salary, um, to understand uh, how much money they might have available to make charitable donations. Um, and there's many different ways to calculate that. And uh, I admittedly, I'm not, I'm not a member of our research team specifically who could give you a much more detailed answer, but um, that is capacity. Affinity, um, we also call inclination. So that's where the peer organizations come into play. Um, and again, it's, it's showing if these uh, individuals have an interest in a cause like neoclassical. Um, and propensity is, uh, it basically is showing that th these people have a history of making charitable gifts. Um, so, you know, some people are more philanthropic than others. So it's just showing that these people already have a history of being philanthropic. Um, so you're not trying to turn them into a donor for the first time, um, because that's obviously can be a more difficult process. Um, so again, with the wealth screen, it weighs those three things together um, and would return that pro score. And again, I don't have all the specifics about the calculations around that, but it's it basically, um, the wealth screen does break it down too. It'll give you a score for their propensity, whether it's high, low, or medium. Um, same with their capacity and their affinity as well. And then the pro score, is a combination of all three of those factors. Okay. Um, during this time of COVID, um, where you know a number of people are out of work and um, their situations are different than they might have been, uh, how applicable have you found this model to be given the times that we're in? Or are the people that you target pretty much uh, unaffected by this period because of the demographic they're in? I would say some and some. Um, one thing that I would say is absolutely there are folks who um, the reason why they did get the capacity rating that they did was because their, their um, wealth is a, a secure thing that is not immediately affected by um, of a pandemic that, that started essentially in January. The other thing that I would say is um, fundraising is not an immediate thing and developing a donor relationship with someone is not an immediate thing. So that these are conversations that you start, you know, in January, but that's not when I would come up to somebody and say, hey, would you like to make a, a board level gift to us right now. Instead, it's a getting to know you process. And I would say that we start that getting to know you process with an open heart and sincere questions about what, what brought them to the show, how it is that, that they uh, entered their information on our database, um, and then go from there in terms of deepening that relationship, telling them more about our programs, and and convincing them to support us. So as much as, um, yes, global economy has been directly affected by the pandemic, the way that you get to know a donor and the way that you encourage them to support you and, and invest in what you're doing, that's not any different on you know a day-to-day -day basis any more than it is on a year-to-year -year basis. Thank you, Hillary. You could we have a question from David Liu. David? Hi, I was just curious how you obtain this information, especially some of this information that's sensitive. How do the patrons reveal that information? Okay, step one, uh, in terms of how we had all of these new um, donors to screen in the first place, 
is that we hold uh, events throughout the year. Uh, we have uh, play readings and performances and people make a reservation to attend. So they RSVP and when they RSVP, they fill out that uh, box off that online box office screen that I described. So they give us their name and their mailing address and their phone number and their email address. Then we provided the new names, mailing addresses and, and phone numbers to Donorly and they used publicly available records, campaign contributions, uh, home purchases, um, that kind of publicly available information in order to glean um, their rankings. Did that answer your question, David? Uh, yes, it does. That's great. Thank you so much. Well, of course. Okay. Um, so we have another question. Uh, Hillary, how did Donnelly's analysis focus your efforts? What could you do differently to engage qualified candidates? Sure, yeah. Um, so we started with about, uh, I think, and, and Megan, stop me if I'm wrong, I think it was like about 2,000, close to 2,000 um, individuals who were new to us, who had, had come to a performance in the past year, now that we were collecting RSVPs, which was wonderful. And so we said, well, I can't personally have coffee or make an introductory email to 2000 people. And I certainly wouldn't as a fund, the chief fundraising officer want to approach somebody who came to our show because they can't afford any other shows and say, Hey, how do, how about you give us money that you don't have? Um, so that's really the, um, analysis and prioritization that I was talking about when it came to the relationship with Donorly, we were able to say, okay, so these, um, I think it was maybe like 17 to 25 people. I can, I can introduce myself to them. Our board members can introduce themselves and say, would you like to know more about that company? What did you think of the show? How was that performance experience for you? And that we can, and can choose who we start that conversation with to deepen that relationship. It doesn't mean that we stop inviting everyone to the shows. It doesn't mean that we stop inviting everyone to join our patrons program. It just means that we give individual personal attention to the people who could support us the most generously. Any other questions for Hillary or Megan? Okay, Hillary, did you want to tell us about King Lear coming yeah. up? Yeah. Um, so we our net our very next performance is a bit of um, what we call bucket list Shakespeare. Um, so on Thursday, June twenty fifth. Uh, at 8 p.m. we will be doing a Zoom reading of uh, King Lear, but with the closing scene as a happy ending uh, written by Nahum Tate, um, of, I think it was like 50 years after uh, Shakespeare's death, and it was performed almost exclusively throughout um, the Federalist era. So until uh, the 1840s, people were under the impression that King Lear was not a, did not have a tragic ending. Um, so we'll be performing a energetic two hour adaptation of King Lear on Thursday, June 25th. It's free and open to the public. You're welcome to register at nyclassical.org. Um, and we would, I'd love to see you there um, to enjoy the performance and to get a taste of um, this this not tragic uh, way that the, that story ends. Thank you. So I hope many of you or all of you will join us uh, virtually at that performance. So if we don't have any more questions, I'll put out one last call. If there are any more questions, we captured everyone. Uh, we have one more. I just want to make sure we don't forget any. Um, um, uh, Megan, do you, did you want to share anything about your other theatrical clients or anything else you'd like us to know about Donorly? 
We ha yeah, like I said, we have a lot of other services besides just donor research, um, but we do make sure that research is at the core of all of our work because I think obviously we all understand the importance of data. Um, so if you're looking for any sort of fundraising support, feel free to reach out to us um, or visit our website. Um, they're both on this slide here um, or feel free to email me directly. Yeah. Great. So uh, my thanks to uh, Hillary and Megan uh, and Bill uh, for making this experience possible. Thank you for a wonderful discussion. Thank you again, Hillary and Megan, and to all of you and have a wonderful evening.